item is uh, ESNP1, proposed conceptual policy recommendations related to licensure and related topics. This is somewhat an extension of last month's discussion, and Dr. Garland is going to come forward and stage it for us, and then I'll invite Dr. Tomberland to continue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, board members. I am Rebecca Garland, the Deputy State Superintendent, and I work with um, licensure policy. So if you'll remember, uh, we started talking with you in December about the fact that we would be bringing a package of policies for you to consider uh, regarding several issues uh, around um, licensure. The policy that has gotten the most attention has been the elimination of standard six and eight. So I felt that we needed to come back and review exactly what we are doing before Dr. Tomberlin uh, comes up and walks you through the policy changes. In the media, uh, it has been reported that the State Board of Education is considering eliminating growth from teacher evaluation, and that is not accurate. want to reiterate, that is not accurate. Um, I spent yes, about over an hour yesterday, in fact, Ms. Bo, you and I did, uh, meeting with one of our senators who was very concerned and actually wrote in his newsletter that the state board was doing away with growth and teacher evaluation and what a misguided uh, direction that was. So we did assure him that we are not doing away with growth and teacher evaluation. And we also wrote a note to all of the education mem uh, members of committees in the General Assembly to, in to assure them that that is not the case. What we are recommending to you is that growth no longer be recorded in a standalone standard, that it will continue to be embedded across all five standards. Every teacher who has a growth metric now will continue to have an EVOS growth metric. Uh, we will still, by school, publish the number of effective highly effective and teachers in need of improvement because we can aggregate that data using the formula that we have now for school reporting. We can report it across the state, which we will have to because of our equity plan that is part of our ESSA um, um, submission when we get ready to do it and the equity plan that's in place now because we have to be able to show in North Carolina, do we have equitable distribution of effective teachers across school systems with children who are low performing, children of poverty, do those teachers get equitable, uh, high quality teachers? So we still have to do all of that work. And so we will use our effectiveness data. The only thing that is changing that we're recommending to you if you choose to change it is that standard six and standard eight no longer be a standalone, but growth will continue to be embedded and included in teacher evaluation. So I just wanted to make sure we were all on the same page uh, because we do not want to send the message. There are many places now in state law where growth is indicated. We have to have growth for our IHE report. We have to have growth to determine who uh, is eligible to be a student teacher's supervising teacher. So it, it's sprinkled now across state law where growth occurs. So we certainly could not do away with growth by state law or by board policy. Dr. Oxen, um, I just wanted to add one other clarification. As we talk about it being embedded, it does not mean that it would be 20% no. of each standard. It would be the professional, the professional judgment of the principal in conversation yes. with the teacher about how that artifact would be used. And I think that that has been a point of misunderstanding that you would make it 20 percent, but it's the professional development, I mean professional judgment of the principal in working with the teacher. In fact, this just this week we met with, well I guess now it's last week, time flies, uh, we met with a group that of testing coordinators and superintendents who are working with us on testing and accountability issues. And one of the superintendents that afternoon says he looks at his, he and his principals look at their EVOS data to make sure that students are not having teachers who are not effective across multiple years because of the impact then that it has on the students future um, you know 
trend to success, whether they will be successful or not. So that, I mean, that was music to my ears. In fact, I told him that's one of the best things I had heard in several years, that the data are being used for what we wanted them to be used for, to ensure that there is equitable distribution of teachers and that we're using it to promote student growth. Not in a punitive way, but to make sure that all students are getting a fair shot and that we're supporting the teachers that need to be supported. So I just wanted to make that clarification because I want to make sure, one, all of you clearly understand that which we are recommending and also for it to be in the record that the board is not, or we're not recommending that you uh, eliminate student growth from teacher evaluation or from anything else where we're using student growth. And so now Dr. Tomlin will kind of walk you through the details of the various policies. Hello again. <clears throat> um, so if we'll, um, I think uh, most of the heavy lifting has been done here, so I will try to be very brief and hit the highlights of what it is we're proposing and certainly um, answer any clarifying questions that you might have. Um, as Dr. Garland explained for the, the first policy recommendation, uh, the elimination of, of standard six and standard eight from the principal evaluation um, process um, does not mean that we stop any of the processes associated with the development of that student growth measure. So all North Carolina final exams, all ASW process, um, all the, the um, assessment associated with generating this measure will continue. Uh, we will continue to report on these findings. Um, one distinction is the, uh, the status will be reported at the school and or district level instead of individual teachers will not see a, a status of in need of improvement or effective or highly effective, but schools will have those percentages presented to them. Um, and that's pretty much, uh, this is the definition of a nominal change. We're simply changing the name of it, nothing um, technical associated with how we, we construct this measure. Yes. Dr. Tomlin, do it, do, will it uh, increase the principal's time management or, or does it have any effect on the uh, efficiency of the, the evaluation process? No, sir, it would not. Would you want some? But that's, would, do I want some? Would you want to do that? I would love to do that. Um, we are, um, Very time that may be another discussion at some future point, but there, um, it doesn't change we, that strongly recognize educator effectiveness strongly recognizes the need for a, m a more manageable process for principals in terms yes. of teacher evaluation thank you are there other questions yes yes uh, dr. Tomlin can you kind of provide some background as to how the this idea um, to eliminate standard six, six has come about if um, it's just a nominal change well the, the, per, the purpose of Standard 6 and Standard 8 has always been to help teachers and principals improve their practice. Um, the response from the field that we've gotten um, is, is that the anxiety that it's producing is kind of counterproductive to that, to that goal. And so this is, I mean, we want to respond to the, message, the, the voice of the field. Um, now to be sure, we will continue to monitor that relationship to see if this, if, if, if removing this as a standard does in fact increase teachers' responsive, responsive, responsiveness to the measure. Do we see more, more teachers improving their performance on, student, on the student growth measure as a result of the removal? That is, that's a research question that we'll continue to look at year after year. Um, another really practical concern here is as a standard, teachers in low performing schools, if they have does not meet expected growth as, as a standard six rating, they would be required to be on a mandatory improvement plan for that measure. Um, and that's never been the intent of the board or the department in terms of standard six and standard eight. Um, and so, 
and the teacher could not do anything in 90 days to affect a different outcome on that measure. Um, and so we were cognizant of that and wanted to, to help alleviate that pressure as well. Other questions? Mr. I just Mr. want Collins? to say thank you for working on this. And if that state senator wants someone else to <laughs> talk to you about, I'll be happy to do that. Uh, this is a step in the right direction. It puts growth where it needs to be. It doesn't take it away. Uh, it probably will need to be tweaked over time to make sure it's right, but it is a big step in, in regaining the confidence of our teachers with respect to their evaluation instrument, and I thank the department for working so hard on this. Thank you. Mr. Davis? I couldn't agree more with Mr. Colony's comments, but um, I'd have to add that um, some of the feedback I've received That's since this sure. topic came up recently is concern by our teachers that principals will now use this data point in five standards, not in just one. And honestly, it just reminds us that we are so reliant on the professional judgment of our principals. And as but one experience I had in my own career as, a, as an officer in the Army was the, the senior rater, the person who rated me was him, him or herself rated on how well he or she rated their officers. That was part of their advice. And I'm, and I know that would be that much more difficult, but I, I am curious and would welcome our principal and superintendent advisors input on how are we um, ensuring that our principals are using sound judgment in making these critical decisions about the uh, growth and development of our teachers because in my opinion, that is the most impactful decision we make as a system. Well, I think the more um, the more data pieces that we ha we have as principals to provide teachers with feedback, um, the better they are able to. It informs instructional practice, and I think that's so important. Yes, we have to take another look at our teacher evaluation rubric with principals. Um, it's it's very overwhelming. Um, to take a 25-page evaluation um, and effective, effectively sit down, um, I would say in my building, with 52 teachers and provide feedback while I'm also doing this piece, you know. Now, and every principal doesn't have that, but that is very intense. Um, and it takes time, and you want to make sure that you use the instrument to be able to give teachers quality feedback um, and I dare also may say that sometimes um, it's so overwhelming that I know that colleagues have taken that rubric and you're, it's a checklist. You're, try, you're just trying to get them done. You're trying to get them done. And we do need to move away from that. So there definitely needs to be, um, need to take a look at the evaluation process so that we can give our teachers high quality feedback to help them improve whether it be using um, their EVOS data to support whether it's, um, it's, it's instructional practice or they need to work more with community engagement. How do you use that data to do that? Um, and that's so important in terms of eliminating it as a standalone item and being able to have a really strong conversation across all five standards to where they need to improve. And I think that's so important. Dr. Fitch. In the, my question, I think, has um, practicality for both this and the next issue. But um, oftentimes, the LEAs are, are hiring, um, and you certify those who come from out of state. What will be the impact of um, these proposed changes with the reciprocity? process for those who are coming to North Carolina from other states, holding clear licenses from whatever state they are coming from and coming into us. So uh, just to clarify, are you speaking in terms of the standard six and standard eight or the subsequent policies that we're going to look well, at? Well, I think because you're decoupling mm -hmm. uh, parts of, of, of the licensure and you're talking about clear licensure, both this issue and the next uh, item on the agenda with Dr. Oxendine and her committee have um, severe implications or critical implications in terms of 
the out-of-state persons who are coming into our systems? So I, I don't think that um, these policies that we're presenting have any impact on reciprocity per se, okay. other than how they're how that is affected by state statute. So it is true that teachers coming f to us from other states will have to pass our testing requirements in order to, be, to receive continuing licenses in North Carolina, but that is not, that's not a matter for the board to decide, that's in state statute. Okay. So that is. North Carolina participates in reciprocity with other states through an interstate compact. What reciprocity means is we accept the educational credentials from teachers from other states. So if Maryland says the teacher met our educational requirements to be licensed in Maryland, we accept that. Every state has its own testing requirements in addition to. So reciprocity really is about your education credentials. There are some states for whom we would accept their test. Um, if a teacher has been teaching for more than three years and they're teaching in an area that is not elementary education or special education, then we can accept with a year of uh, adequate performance in North Carolina, we can offer, we can issue them a, a continuing license after one year. When the General Assembly raised the testing requirements for reading and mathematics for elementary teachers and for special education teachers, we were required in the 2013 budget bill, I believe it was, to have a task force that included higher education as to how all of these laws would be implemented in board policy. The task force concluded that the purpose of the legislation was to improve the quality of North Carolina teachers in elementary school. And if half of your teachers come from out of state and you accept lower standards in terms of reading and math performance than the teachers that you have, you will never improve the quality of teaching in the elementary school. So the task force recommendation to the board and was accepted by the board was that moving forward after 2014, any teacher teaching special ed or elementary would have to have the same standard in terms of knowledge in reading and knowledge in mathematics to teach in our state. So going forward, those teachers will have two years to demonstrate that they can um, pass those tests. But that's, there was a process how all of that made its way into policy. Yes, uh, one question, one additional question, and then we're going to uh, probably break for lunch according to Chairman Kobe and ask you to return for a few more minutes, Dr. Sure. Topham, after lunch. Mr. Oh, Mayavid. this might not be the place to be asking this, and it might be coming somewhere else on the agenda, but uh, uh, this is a little bit of a follow-up to the conversation just had. First of all, thank you on Standard 6. That's, that's good work, and I, I understand that. The remainder of these recommendations on this um, item, one, two, three, four, five more of these, with a lot of bullets, are associated with licensure. Yes. And I guess my question at some level is connecting the dots to recruitment and retention and assuring that the part that licensure plays in that, and whether it's initial, or whether it's reciprocity, or whether it's renewal, but there's an important part of that. Uh, the superintendent reminded us this month that we're, we've got a significant backlog there. And I see some words in here I like, streamline. Mm -hmm. uh, I see some other words in, other things in here, like decouple the licensure from employment. I, I don't know all the consequences, but I think that's probably a good, that appears to me to, to be a, a, a good thing. I know the IHEs are struggling with with this and uh, and LEAs are with the, the backlog and so what are we about 7,000 we're going to discuss it later okay well then I just answered it I'm not it is out of but I do think that these policies that that backlog should be considered so that we're not complicating the system even worse Absolutely. by having policies and on one hand we're trying to get the backlog uh, uh, 
out of the way and at the same time we're creating policies that create a backlog sure I understand <laughs> dr. Atkinson we have a committee comprised of superintendents principals and human resources a human resource directors and one of the goals of that group is to identify where we can streamline and change licensure uh, policies that will still meet the needs of our students but at the same time reduce paperwork and to have a more efficient system so the three recommendations that you see are the four recommendations uh, beyond standard six are our first steps in streamlining lining and reducing the complexity of the licensure system process. Thank you.